The kitchen in our house is on the small side. Okay, that's an understatement. If our kitchen had one of those maximum occupancy signs hanging on the wall, it would say no more than two full-sized humans should be allowed in it at one time. With a small kitchen comes an underwhelming amount of countertop real estate. For the last five years, we've lived with a microwave the size of a small car, taking up much of that precious counter space. Now with our kitchen renovation well underway, we decided to buy a new microwave and hang it over the stove to gain back that lost countertop. The only thing we still needed was a cabinet that had enough space under it, so let's build one. This is the over the stove microwave cabinet with built in slide out spice rack organizer thing project. Here we go. You already saw the demolition of the existing cabinet, and that was executed rather gingerly because I wanted to avoid as much drywall work as possible and save the structure of the cabinet body on the right side. I wanted to try breaking down an entire sheet of plywood on the table saw instead of using a circular saw first. It's possible, and I got it done, but it was heavy and awkward to push that full sheet through the saw, and it was definitely less precise because I kept pulling the sheet away from the fence. Lesson learned, rough out the sheet with a handheld saw, then true up the edges with the table saw. I pulled out my crosscut sled next and cut all the pieces to length according to my crudely sketched diagram. This right here is the first time I ever used edge banding, and just like on prom night, I started off pretty cautious. Once I got the hang of it, it was quick and painless. Uh, the edge banding, that is, not the awkward teenage socializing. I cut a strip as close to the right length as possible, and then I used a paper towel between the iron and the banding to keep from messing up the family iron. Pressing down on the banding with the iron melts the glue on the back side just enough for it to grab a hold of the end grain of the plywood. I use an ink roller, the same one I use to spread glue on large glue ups, to press the banding down firmly while it cools back down. I used pocket holes and glue to join all the pieces of the cabinet together. In the process of designing the cabinet, I paid close attention to where I wanted the holes to go in order to hide them without having to deal with plugging them. Whenever possible, the holes face the ceiling, the wall, or the inside of the cabinet. I managed to work it out so that the only exposed holes were under the tall side of the cabinet. You would only be able to see them if you were laying on the floor, but I took the time to plug them anyway. I also drilled a long series of shelf pin holes in the tall side so we could have a series of adjustable shelves in there once we decided what we were going to store there. I ripped down a bunch of solid oak boards into strips to use for the face frame. I cut them all to length, then drilled another pile of pocket holes, two in the end of each vertical strip. I used my T-Track table with all the stops and jigs and clamps that I could force into the situation to keep everything perfectly square while I glued and screwed the pieces together. Next I put some glue on the plywood face of the cabinet, then set the face frame on top. Starting with the longest 90 degree corner, I clamped the two parts together and shot in a brad nail. With this corner locked in, I worked my way around the whole perimeter, pulling the cabinet body flush with the outside edge of the face frame. I am happy to report that all of my measurements were right and this method made every 90 degree corner on the cabinet come out perfectly square. Building the face frame slightly oversized, then truing it up with a flush trim bit in a trim router would have been easier, but I wanted to try it this way and I got the exact result I wanted. Now all that happy squareness is nice, but it was actually rendered more or less irrelevant by the Picassian nature of my kitchen walls. So in the process of trying to figure out how I wanted this sliding spice rack to come together, I, I knew what I wanted the finished thing to be, but I didn't know how to get it there. So I made all the shelves and just started attaching them from the bottom first to the sliding panel. And as soon as I got the second one on, I kind of had this epiphany moment and went, aha, that's what I'm going to do. So. It's, uh, it's interesting in the design phases sometimes where you know where you're going, don't know how to get there, so just start working on it, in my case anyway, and eventually the idea is going to come to you. Um, so anyway, the trick is I needed a way to put sidewalls on these without actually just shoving a board on the side of it. So now that I've seen it in place, I know what I want to do, and I took the remainder of the shelves and taped them together so that they're all perfectly in line. I'm going to go back over to the table saw and cut a little bit of a, a corner chunk out of each end of this. Um, it'll make sense when I show you a little bit later how that's going to come together. The issue is that these two shelves are now stuck in place so I can't get it to the table saw to do what I'm trying to do. But that's not a huge deal. I will just cut these corners out by hand and then we'll be ready to keep rolling on. I could have used my dado set here, but I figured it would take me longer to get that dialed in than it would just using a single blade and multiple cuts. I used glue and brad nails through the back to attach the shelves to the sliding panel. 
I use spacer blocks slightly taller than typical spice bottles to keep the spacing square and even. To go back and notch out the first two shelves that were already in place, I traced around a strip of wood that would connect the shelves, then I cut the notches out with a handsaw. I found it helpful to hold the blade against the faces of the existing notches to keep the cuts straight. I put a dab of glue in each notch, then clamped the strips in place using the overkill method. If you've never heard of the overkill method, you should definitely look it up because it will change your life. I applied stain, then a couple of coats of poly. This resulted in a finish that was durable and matched the look of the hardwood floors throughout the rest of the house. The last spice rack I made used eye bolts and elastic as a way to keep the containers from slipping off the shelves and it worked really well, so I went with that strategy one more time. Trading a little muscle assistance from my brother for the promise of a hot meal, we held the cabinet in place while I ran screws through the apron on the back side into the studs. Then we hoisted the new microwave up and hooked it into the mounting bracket. After running the power cord into the cabinet, we tilted it into position and installed the screws through the top. It was a few days later before I put in some shelves and slid in the spice rack. You can see that Katie was excited about her new cabinet and already started moving in. As for the cabinet doors, I plan on doing another video specifically about measuring, making, and installing those. At this point, we have half the kitchen finished, and now that I have a better understanding of the process and our own requirements, I can dig into the rest of it and show you what I've learned.